evening, dear friends. I am from the LGBTQIA plus community. For those who don't know, LGBTQIA stands for lesbian, a woman who's in love with a woman, gay, a man who's in love with a man, bisexual, an individual who's in love with both genders, transgender, an individual who would like to transcend from their birth assigned gender, intersex, a person who's born with both genders, asexual, a person who does not use sexual modes of expression, and queer, which is an umbrella term for all the individuals within the non-heteronormative spectrum. I am a queer person and identify with the pronouns she and her, and I am a lesbian. Being a queer brown girl from middle-class Indian family has been a great battle. It has been a non-stop battle with myself and with the patriarchal society. It took many years before I could proudly stand here and reveal in front of you all proudly that I am queer. In the process of that battle, I evolved from being a self-hating person to understanding that queerness is normal and that I deserved a dignified life which was being denied only because of patriarchy. And today, dear friends, I am a social and a queer activist using films and art as a tool for my activism, advocating against patriarchy. What is patriarchy? Patriarchy is the world's most controversial norm. And it sets all the political scenarios of the world the way it does. Patriarchy means the rule of father. And this rule gives dominance for cisgendered, heteronormative men. If this rule reaped only good results, dear friends, I wouldn't be here advocating against it, but this rule has curbed the scientific growth of a collective of men, of women, of children, and many, many aspects. When I was a teenager in school, all my peers were falling in love with the opposite gender, and I was going on falling in love with my female peers. And at the age of 12, I was in love with one of my classmates who's a female. And at that age, I knew that I could not openly express my love. So I hid my feelings and faked my infatuations towards the opposite gender. Trust me, it was so suffocating. I hated myself. And just then, there was this Bollywood film called The Girlfriend that was released. That film portrayed a woman who was in love with another woman as a villain. This film was the talk of the school back then, and I was so scared people would get to know about me, and I tried to isolate myself and withdrew from completely socializing. By the time I was in bachelor's, I studied fine arts, fine arts painting. And once again, I fell in love with a female peer. But this time, I wanted to break free. I was done. I was suffocated with faking my infatuation. So I mustered my courage. I went to her, and I told her, I love you. But she and her homophobic friends began bullying me. And as I had feared in my teens, I was vilified. I was called sinner, abnormal, a lesbo, 
And that was the first time I learned about the term lesbian and all the other terms within the queer spectrum. Eventually, gradually going to college became a nightmare because I was bullied and I wanted to end it all and I was very close to taking my life. I'm so glad I did not do that and I'm alive here today. And I'm alive here today with you all. But back then, to cope with the trauma, I went back into my little shell and began painting all my feelings and explored myself and sexuality through paintings. One day in art history class, I learned that a famous painter, Da Vinci, was a gay man. I was so thrilled. <laughs> So I studied more about history, and I wanted to see more uh, what I could learn about queerness in the past. And what I learned was not just Da Vinci, but Shakespeare, Michelangelo, Bupen Kakkar, Frida Kahlo, Tarkovsky, many, many more great people were queer. And I felt less alone that I was not the only sinner and abnormal. I started reading more history, not to just pass my exams, but to live, to survive. And a small ray of hope started blossoming in my world of self-hate. And I began embracing myself for the first time. When I, as I read more history, and examined the events that I learned about. I understood that before kingship could begin, before when we were hunters and gatherers, there was no slavery and monogamous marriage system. A woman in hunter and gatherer tribe would have an intercourse with many men. And so the child she bore would eventually become the responsibility of a whole community than just two parents of the opposite sex. The men of the hunter and gatherer tribe had to work hard to woo a woman in order to have an intercourse with her. Forced sexual acts were not an occurrence. And something life-changing realization happened at that time. Abusing of women's consent started only after monarchy, after kingship, and after slavery. How did monarchy even start? As hunters and gatherers, Humans were nomads. But after human beings discovered agriculture, they could move away from a nomadic life and settle down, a concept of settling down that exists to, till today. When humans begin owning lands to cultivate and start agriculture, a competent a territorial competition between human species begin. Hate begin. Hierarchies begin. Hierarchies, depending on how much lands each owned, begin. And that's how kingship begin. And to protect that kingship, monogamous heteronormative marriages were invented. These marriages were a taxed system under the king's rule. If anybody got married without paying that tax to the king, they did not avail a dignified life, and their children were considered as bastards. Women were used 
to transact and expand wealth and kingdoms through monogamous heteronormative marriage systems. And that's how, till today, we can observe the practice of surnames. Every woman's surname signifies the identity of her father or her husband. Majority of wealth was privatized and owned through, non -mono through monogamous heteronormative marriages. Male children were more valued. Why? Because more male children meant more men. More men meant more kingdom to the king. Oppression be began with religious extremism. Control of sexuality and through the existing institution of marriage, mass poverty eventually came to existence through the king's rule. Female infanticides grew with the value of male child rising. Women became the second class citizens and patriarchy became a norm to, the, to this day. And that's how queer intercaste interracial, and such kind of heteronormative love are still banned. Coming back to my queer experiences as a young adult, when I was about in the final year of my bachelor's, I began hunting for more queer content in history and found some queer films. And most of Indian queer films portrayed LGBTQI members in a very derogatory manner. Example, The Girlfriend, the Bollywood film Girlfriend. And there was only one film at that time which was pro-queer and that was called Fire. But when I watched that film, I was so heartbroken to see that two women were falling in love with each other because they were denied love from their husbands. No, that's not the reality of queer people. And when I tried hunting for more global queer films, I came across this one film called If These Walls Could Talk, Part Two. This enriched me so much. This film was about women from different eras breaking free and coming out as queer people. At that time, I knew I wanted to make films. I wanted to make films for the broken. I wanted my films to empower the broken. And that's how I realized the power of films. I was suddenly filled with so much pride for who I was. And with that newfound pride in myself, finally walking away from self-hate, I wanted to confide about my sexuality to one of the most dearest person of my life. And so I went to my father and told him that I am a lesbian. My father, the very well-educated man, was completely shattered. He did not talk to me for two days, and the third day he started beating me so bad that I had a broken jaw. My idea of father and father figure turned upside down at that point. So I lied to my father, and I told him, I'm not queer anymore. And I requested him to fund my further education in films and financially support me. My father was very happy that I had unqueered myself. And he agreed to fund my education in films. I studied films in a city far away from home where it was easy for me to be who I was. And that's how I started attending queer meetings, queer meetups, and met a lot of queer people. I was so 
thrilled to meet all these people, and I started having a sense of community, finally. And by the end of the film school, I had my first live-in relationship, a queer uh, live-in relationship with a woman, who is now my ex. My girlfriend's father was very unhappy with our relationship, and he got the police involved. The police took me into their captivity, accusing me of being a pimp, running a brothel by kidnapping his daughter, which was a complete lie. This happened in 2012. And, but in 2012, this was decriminalized, and the police had no reason to take me as a queer person, and that's how they took me with a false accusation. Right now, India is fighting to legalize queer marriages and queer parenting. Though Section 377 has been decriminalized, it is a very unsafe space. Our society is an unsafe space for us queer folks to exist. I have lost a lot of my queer friends from my community in the recent past for, this, for suicide. Every suicide signifies the failure of a society. It shows that we as a collective lack compassion and lack the skill of including diversity. Dear friends, if you know a queer person who may be your daughter, your son, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, a friend, an acquaintance, anybody, please understand we are fighting a battle. Please be kind to us. And to all the queer folks out there who are out and proud and the ones who are fighting your battle inside your closet, I would, I would like you all to know that you are precious, important, and valuable.